Hear ye, hear ye, the Honorable Chief Justice and Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Michigan. All persons having business with this Honorable Court are admonished to grab an eye and give their attention to the court of our city. God save the United States, the State of Michigan, and this Honorable Court. <laughs> Welcome uh, to the final day of uh, our final uh, set of oral arguments for the calendar year 2016. And uh, a bit of uh, whimsy on my part, this will be the last time I preside as chief of this court, so this will be my valedictory uh, uh, oral argument. For those of you who have not uh, been here recently, I would simply remind you that we have read your materials. We don't really need a recitation of facts or history and, unless you think it's germane to the uh, case. What we really need you to do in the uh, few moments, the five minutes in a calendar case, uh, two in a, in a MOA, is to use those uninterrupted moments to tell us what the outcome determinative issues are in your case and why they should drive us, impel us to decide in favor of your client. So with that, I will call the first case, uh, In Re Contempt of uh, Kelly Dorsey. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, my name is Kurt Kohler. I represent the appellant. Kelly Michelle Dorsey in this matter, and I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Okay. As an initial matter, I'd like to note that the references to collateral convictions of my client in the prosecution's brief, I don't believe those were in the record. I didn't see a record cite on those, and if they can't provide a record cite, the court shouldn't consider them. Secondly, on the authority of Rose versus Aaron, the jail time and fines imposed on my client for contempt, because the sentence was suspended pending appeal. Those cannot be reimposed upon remand. And third, the main point in this case is that you have a delinquency matter where the parent is going to be unadjudicated because there's no way to adjudicate a parent in a delinquency matter. And you have a drug testing order which implicates the fitness of the parent. So the fitness of the parent really is something that should be addressed in an abuse and neglect case rather than in a delinquency case. And when you have that kind of situation, in a delinquency case, the parent is not going to have the same due process protection, such as access to counsel, that she would have had if she had been, if this had been done in the abuse and neglect case. So that is the main point of my argument. And of course, I've made several other arguments in this, namely that the trial court lacks subject matter jurisdiction, that the there are exceptions to the collateral bar rule, namely meaningful, no meaningful opportunity for the appellant to appeal and irretrievable surrender of constitutional rights. And we believe that this issue was preserved for appeal through, um, through bringing it during the motion, the post-trial motion, which this case is not an evidentiary um, matter. It's not a motion to suppress. So bringing a post-trial motion can preserve it for appeal. Why now, is it a sufficient opportunity to appeal? The zone, is it? Yes. You get three minutes, right? <laughs> Two. Well, you didn't. Light's not up. I'm sorry. I'll accept all my colleagues. I'll accept my colleagues' apologies. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, apologize. I <laughs> Somebody <laughs> fell asleep. That's okay. <laughs> um, so the question is, why isn't it sufficient opportunity to appeal that your client could have brought an application for leave to appeal in Michigan, which is uh, a remedy, right. you know, more uh, available, uh, uh, I suppose, than the federal system. Well, she wouldn't have it, had a right to appeal. And secondly, right. were, that's the premise of his question. Right. Why couldn't she? Why right. wasn't the, she obligated to file an application for leave? And right. why isn't that a sufficient opportunity for her? It's not a sufficient opportunity because the probation officer changed the circumstances when she um, requested the drug test twice weekly for 90 days, whereas the original orders just said random drug testing. Is so that suddenly, a material change. It is a material change because you've got a much greater intrusion into your privacy rights and you can't appeal the request of the probation what, officer. What does is, what is random drug testing entail? In this case, it just entailed one-off drug testing every so often. It didn't entail a systematic, scheduled, regularly scheduled program of drug testing. 
But, the, but, but it could have been, I mean, if, if, this, if your complaint is it was random at first and then it changed to regular, but random, you know, you're saying, well, it was just once a week or every, every so often, but could also be like every day. So it could have been worse if we stuck with the prior you know, there's no systemization to right. it. So my, I don't I don't know how she's materially better off or worse off by going from random to regular. Can I have a, an antecedent question? <clears throat> if there's an invasion of her constitutional rights, it's the obligation to submit to any drug testing, correct? Right. So the invasion occurred when the, the court, according to you, without authority, uh, ordered your client to do any drug testing. It's at that point, is it not, that she's obligated to defend her constitutional rights by challenging that decision. And I don't understand, uh, therefore, you know, I don't care what happened after that point, but, but why wasn't she obligated to, to seek uh, an interlocutory appeal to challenge the order that she uh, submit to drug testing. Well, again, it's it's a different situation once you get to January 2012 because you've got the abuse and neglect cases closed. I don't tell me again. Why why is it a different she she knows and she doesn't challenge that she got the order, right? Right. Okay. So why was she permitted once she is uh, apprised of the court's direction order? to submit to drug testing, which she believes is an invasion of her constitutional right, why is she permitted to rest, to, to sit on her rights and not challenge that opinion? I think each drug test is an, a separate and independent invasion of that constitutional right. Hmm. So you've got, usually you don't have these orders out there for that <laughs> long, and here it's almost a year. Well, so, okay, well, doesn't that get worse then for your client's sake? I mean, right. she rested a year then on on a an order that that in her view constitutionally intruded upon her constitutional rights. Right, and by the time does, she, that, does that make it better or worse for your case? It's not particularly. It's not ideal. We'll put it that way. So we're trying to find a way through the needle. That may be. That may well be. However. The fact remains that this is a different situation once you get there. The time to appeal had run, so by January 2012, she had no appeal. And therefore, this makes this a collateral attack, correct? It depends on whether we're going with the Sanders precedent or we're going with the collateral borrow precedent. Under Sanders, it would not be a direct, it would not be a collateral attack under Sanders. Why do you think that the uh, family court uh, had no um, subject matter jurisdiction? I think it's because when you look at the statute 712A6 and uh, accompanying statute 712A.18, they, when you read those together, you have to read in, you have to see that it's reasonable orders that the court can issue. So if it's unreasonable. So this is an unreasonable order. Right, because does that, it does that again. Do you understand the distinction between the the what the courts historically said the want of subject matter jurisdiction right. and the uh, perhaps inappropriate exercise of subject matter right. jurisdiction? Aren't we in the latter, not the former here? I understand that when you're talking about order, you're usually talking about the exercise of subject matter jurisdiction, obviously. But the way the, the, you don't deny that that the this family court had the authority, subject matter jurisdiction, in the appropriate circumstance to order a parent to be submit to submit to drug test. If it was a reasonable order. Right. Okay. So you're you're challenging this was an unreasonable order because the judge hadn't dotted the I's and crossed well, the T's. I think I think what the Court of Appeals did is they framed the issue as saying that they don't have subject matter jurisdiction to issue on constitutional orders. I'm saying they don't have subject matter jurisdiction no, to issue. No, actually, courts do have subject matter jurisdiction. Right. That, and if, they're, if they issue constitutional they orders, they, they may be vitiated on appeal, but they are not 
they do not deprive the court of the of the subject matter jurisdiction. Right. Do you agree with that? That's just how they frame the issue. I'm and saying that would be incorrect, then, right? Right. I'm saying that the way the that statutes that would be incorrect way of framing subject matter jurisdiction, isn't it? I think it matters on how the statutes are written in this case because it talks about jurisdiction in terms of orders. So that's an unusual situation that you wouldn't usually see in a statute because usually we're talking about a circuit court. And in a circuit court, this wouldn't work at all. We have a limited court of limited jurisdiction. And this particular statute, because you have a delinquency case where there is no way to reach the parent other than through that statute, 712A6 or 712.18. And I discussed that in my brief thoroughly enough. But without that, there is no way to reach the parent in this case. They rely on that statute. And the way that statute is written, it says that you're limited to, in 712A.18, reasonable, reasonable conditions. And that's what they can impose on probation of the um, juvenile. So that's my argument on that point. Okay. It's statutory. I'm actually relying a lot on that Moreno case out of Utah in the way that they express that in that opinion. Okay. Anything else? Well, I think I'd also just say that um, under the irretrievable surrender of constitutional rights issue, I don't believe that's limited to the Fifth Amendment context. And even the uh, AG's office in its brief mentioned subpoenas and other things and compared this case to those. So, I mean, at that point, you're kind of mixing Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment issues there. And there's really no logical reason not to apply it to a Fourth Amendment case. I, my biggest concern with their argument about these exceptions to the collateral uh, rule is that I don't yet understand why your client was deprived of an opportunity to challenge a, an order that she felt was unconstitutional or beyond, in your terms, the subject matter jurisdiction of the family court to, to issue? Well, I think it, there's really no way she could have done it at that point. She wasn't, in the delinquency case, she was not represented by counsel. She had counsel in the other case, but that's speculative to say he would have helped her in this. Does that, it's not on the record. Does that, is that the determinant whether a, a person is represented, well, especially since there's no obligation at those in those proceedings that she be represented. Right. I'm not arguing for a civil Gideon here. I'm just saying. Right. Well, then, then what are you arguing? I'm if, just if, saying if that she, she didn't have a counsel. Understood. That makes it harder. But mm -hmm. but from a, a a legal standpoint, what is it that precluded her from exercising her rights? She had no meaningful opportunity to appeal based on the practical circumstances of the matter. She didn't have counsel. It was an issue of first impression before the Court of Appeals. Michigan hadn't addressed it before. It's unlikely she would have been had any chance of doing this pro se. Okay. Hmm. So that's part of the argument. And the other argument, of course, I've already addressed as far as just timing. And it was a different request than she'd ever had before. And significantly more intrusive at that. And I believe I'm probably in my rebuttal time. So. <clears throat> May it please the court, William Warden, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney for Livingston County on behalf of the people. Um, with me at council table is Eric Restucia, the uh, Assistant Solicitor General, and I will be giving him five minutes of my time. You have to manage your own time. We would ask the court to deny leave in this matter. Um, we feel that uh, it would be a bad thing to um, add these exceptions to the collateral bar rule in Michigan. Michigan has been a state since 1837 for almost 180 years. The collateral bar rule has worked well in this state and there's no reason to add those exceptions to the rule of law. The, also, we would uh, submit that you cannot deny or you cannot defy a facially valid order. And that was the premise of the, uh, our uh, argument in the Court of Appeals. Uh, you can't create a system where the indigent, indigent don't have to comply with court orders. Um, I would, I would um, like to mention uh, there was an order in the neglect abuse case which 
And I'll read very briefly. This order, by the way, was prior to the order in the delinquency case. But one of the conditions was respondent mother Kelly Dorsey shall submit to random drug testing at least once per week. Parenting time shall be contingent upon respondent mother Kelly Dorsey's drug screens being negative. So there was an order in place which was very restrictive, required random drug testing at least once a week. Now, we submit that that's when she should have challenged this. When that order was issued on the 6th of January of 2011 in the case where she was represented by counsel. Now, we're not saying that because she was unrepresented in the delinquency case that she should receive relief from this court. What we are saying is that she had the opportunity. She was savvy regarding her rights in the delinquency case when her son was being interviewed by a police officer, a detective. She invoked his right to counsel. After the defendant or the juvenile delinquent was informed of his Miranda rights. Did she invoke his right to appeal too? Well, I don't have any anecdotal information on that, Your Honor. Everybody kind of knows Miranda, but maybe not the other. Okay. As far as the exceptions to the collateral bar rule, she did have a meaningful opportunity for appellate review. She could have, people file, indigent people, pro per filings occur in the hundreds in the court of appeals. There are forms that people can fill out. They can go to the website, scale forms, which they can download and fill out and ask. They can even ask the trial court for an attorney and be represented if he appoints one. Now, one of the things that, and it's commendable on the part of Mr. Kohler, he's representing the defendant pro bono. So she knew that, you know, she could obtain counsel, and she did in this particular case. So you concede, I think in your supplemental brief, that she's entitled to some form of relief. Is that right? Well, Your Honor, this case. And we have in a published opinion that you want us not to address a conclusion that the ordered drug tests were unconstitutional. We did not cross appeal, Your Honor. And, you know, in hindsight. Well, you're asking us to deny. Yes, Your Honor. That would leave intact a published opinion saying that the underlying order was unconstitutional. Is that your view? Is that your view? Was the underlying drug testing unconstitutional? The underlying drug testing. Even if we agree with you about the collateral bar. It was an issue of first impression in the state of Michigan. That's a really easy question. And I intend to answer it, Your Honor. Good, eventually. Yes. The answer is yes, because of the case law that's imported from other jurisdictions, which seems to show that if she tested positive, that could be turned over by the probation officer to law enforcement and she could be prosecuted. So we do have, you know, at least if your theory of subject matter jurisdiction makes this a collateral appeal rather than one that's subject to any of the exceptions, what do we do about the fact that you and you agree that the order was unconstitutional? Well, the order is also moot. The juvenile in this case is now 22 years old. He's in the adult criminal system. But she has been held in contempt. And the sanction, the sentence has not been imposed. It's been held in abeyance until these appeals are completed. So unless the court does something, she has still been adjudicated of being in contempt of an order you concede is unconstitutional. So we deny leave and you're okay with her being sent to jail even though you concede? May I make a brief observation and then come right back to your question? 
The fact that the trial court judge stayed the sentence, the fines, and the costs, after he heard Mr. Kohler's argument that it was unconstitutional, indicates that he would have stayed it earlier if that argument had been made, after he issued the order. So, but now getting back in answer to your question, there is Supreme Court precedent. It's been cited to the court. It's Aaron, that particular case. Another one is Holland v. Weed, where the court said that the dignity of the lower court need not be upheld by imposing the sentence that was originally made for the contempt. So, I mean, this court could issue an order denying leave with a directive to the trial court to follow Aaron v. Rose, or Rose v. Aaron, and there should not be an addition to Michigan's law regarding obeying an order. An order should be obeyed by the parties. That part is subsumed under the collateral. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So, as I understand it, your view is that if we uphold the application of the collateral review preclusion, you're not opposed to the court addressing the apparent unconstitutionality of the contempt predicated, the contempt proceeding based on the unconstitutionality of the underlying order, so that we might prevent the appellant from suffering the consequences of having been adjudicated in contempt. That is correct. But I'm not sure how we would get there. How do we, we would, if we're not going to, if we're not going to have these exceptions to the collateral bar rule, then how is it that this court could offer the relief that you're suggesting we offer? By suggesting to the trial court that it not impose that. Rose v. Aaron and Holland v. Weed addressed the same questions when there was a contempt and the underlying order was invalid. So those cases, and one of them is from 1891, the other one is, I think, from the 50s, 1956. So, I mean, there's longstanding precedent for doing that, Your Honor. If there are no further questions. You believe the Court of Appeals was correct in concluding the search was unconstitutional. Is that your position? Yes, Your Honor. Did anybody at any point in the proceedings argue that this could be a valid administrative search and an exception to the Fourth Amendment? No, Your Honor. Is there something not conceivable or developable on that point? I mean, it seems to me that there's a body of case law that talks about special needs exceptions and administrative searches, and this might fall into it since it was never used to prosecute for a crime. I agree, Your Honor. And in hindsight, we should have cross-appealed. And I guess that's my problem. Cross-appeal or not, there's a published Court of Appeals case out there saying this is an unconstitutional search. And you think that's okay? Well, he thinks it is unconstitutional, except maybe it falls within the administrative exception. Yeah, okay. Then it isn't. Well, that was just a point that was raised. I was trying to understand why we would leave that case there. To put it in context, Your Honor, the family court needs tools in order to get parents to comply with the rehabilitation of the minor. And generally, that is the goal. It's not to punish the adult. We understand what the objects here are, but the question is whether the court below, as I said, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, and made the connection that the statute permits it to make to say, in order to help the child under my jurisdiction, I'm asking the mother of that child to undergo drug testing because I see a link there that we need to be conscious of. That's all the statute requires. Had that been patent in the record, there wouldn't be any challenge to the underlying order. 
But you can see that it's unconstitutional, as opposed to something perhaps that might not be unconstitutional. Well, do you want to? Tie, I think I think Mr. Restucia is, is in the starting blocks there, and he looks like he's going to explode. Yes, Your Honor, I would I would give the rest of my time to Mr. Yeah. Restucia. You only get three minutes, Mr. Thank you, Restucia. Your Honor. He had talk four fast. yesterday and did well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk talk fast. Faster than yesterday. May it please the court, Eric Restucia, uh, appearing on behalf of the Attorney General, as, appearing as amicus. I think it's an easy solution to the Fourth Amendment issue. The court should just assume for the purposes of argument that it's unconstitutional. But the whole point of the collateral bar rule is that you don't reach the underlying order. The well, we have, no, no. You're, you're finessing an issue that is uh, problematic because we have a, court, a published Court of Appeals decision which uh, your, your <coughs> colleague says we should leave intact by denying. But, well, the, I, I don't think it's, the, the, it's, the state's position isn't that the court should deny leave, but rather it should uh, provide clarity for the analysis. In fact, part of the, uh, the briefing is what does it mean for meaningful opportunity for appeal and what's irreparable injury and how does the Manus uh, doctrine work? But it's clear that if the collateral rule applies, you don't review the underlying order for its constitutionality. In other words, the Court of Appeals analysis on that point would be obiter dictum. And so that it would not be binding on subsequent panels of the Court of Appeals, nor should it bind lower courts because it didn't need to reach that issue. In fact, it was foreclosed from reaching that issue because the collateral bar rule applied here. So I, I, th well, I think it's helpful for the court, though, is <laughs> if you assume it's unconstitutionality, but don't reach that issue. In fact, note that that issue did not need to be reached. You clarify the collateral bar rule, which makes that very point. A order can be clearly invalid, but if you have jurisdictional authority, it has to be followed. That's how the state operates. That's how it always operates. That we often think that an order was improperly entered, but we comply. And I think that the same rules apply to state agencies, state employees, ordinary citizens. She had an opportunity to file an interloc interlocutory appeal. In fact, the Court of Appeals has information about filings. There have been 5,000 this year. Half of them have been civil. More than 10% of the civil filings in the Michigan Court of Appeals this year were by pro per uh, practitioners. In fact, if this court had any reservations, frankly, about meaningful opportunity for appeal as a, an exception, the court's not even bound to create that as an exception. The only exception in the common law in Michigan, as it stands now, is jurisdiction. If you get the am amateur out, it just says jurisdiction. That's the traditional rule. The Manus case talks about irreparable injury. That's for the federal common law. The state's not bound to follow that. In fact, I don't think it's particularly persuasive that a uh, compulsory self-incrimination is a unique injury that cannot be redeemed by the subsequent legal proceedings. It seems to me that it can, but it doesn't matter anyway. The federal system is very different from the state system. You can't get into the federal system very easily on in an interlocutory basis. In fact, the general rule for non-parties, like, like um, Ms. Dorsey, is that you have to be in contempt before the court can obtain jurisdiction. So the court encourages contempt and says you're free to disobey. That's not the way Michigan should operate because we have a permissive appellate process, and it undermines respect for the rule of law to say to people, you can have a facially valid order and you can refuse to comply with it and then challenge its validity after you found a contempt. That doesn't foster respect for the rule of law. Ms. Dorsey was bound to take action before the time in which she was found in contempt. And because she failed to do so, all that she can do on appeal is challenge the elements of contempt which were all established, which was that she, prov she was provided notice, there was an order, she failed to comply and she was able to comply and it was clear and her uh, defiance was willful. She was by guilty my, of the crime. By my count, your word count exceeded three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I'd just like to point out the abuse and neglect case was closed before this request came through from the probation officer. Secondly, meaningful opportunity to appeal is just that, meaningful. Without an attorney, she did not have a meaningful opportunity to appeal, and she could not appeal a, pro I, a request. I, I really don't even understand the legal provenance of that argument. Since citizens have a right to do it pro se, they do it all the time. In fact, today we actually have far more resources for people who are unrepresented, the websites that the court has put on online. I, I, I don't understand why practical considerations like that are are relevant to the, whether she could have sought leave from the Court of Appeals to challenge an order she believed was unconstitutional. Well, the Oregon case I cited, Crenshaw, actually did say practical considerations were a factor in meaningful leave to, in having a meaningful opportunity to appeal. 
So I would practical in the sense of what? Whether we were like the federal system that makes uh, interlocutory appeals virtually impossible, or in a permissive system like theirs that makes them possible. It may be possible, but if you don't really have the knowledge to pursue them, then is that? No, you have to. Okay. So if you don't really have the knowledge to pursue them, they're not going to be meaningful. So now the, the law is that if you don't know your legal rights, it's not a, uh, you're no. not obligated to. Uh, no, this is just an exception to the collateral bar rule that gets you to an opportunity to be heard on appeal if you didn't directly appeal, which if you look at the Hendrickson case, they cited the person directly appealed, and then they decided they didn't want to obey it even after they lost on direct appeal. So that sort of situation isn't what we have here. We had no direct appeal. So we're just asking for an opportunity to present these issues okay. at some point. And if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank the court. and Thank you. The case is submitted.